Good morning, Pastor Gene Oliver, Word of Hope Church in Katie's, Kentucky. I want to thank you folks on, on Facebook Live and uh, on uh, the recap on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today with our congregation that's meeting here in person. And I want to encourage you, if you watch us on Facebook or the YouTube recap, to, to comment, to like it, to subscribe, uh, to share, uh, so that the gospel might go a little bit further. We understand seven countries of the world have watched some of our stuff, and 12 states watch our stuff uh, periodically, and uh, we just thank God for that opportunity. In a time when the world is trying to shut the gospel down, at least in America, where churches are struggling to stay open because of uh, some of the government rulings, and yet the gospel is being preached to more people than ever before, so we give God thanks for that, and we thank God for you guys watching and participating in our services. So God bless you today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. We can stand up. Turn to Romans, uh, the fourth chapter. Romans, the fourth chapter. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> verse 21. And I've got a lot of scripture, like always, but just one verse to start us with. The title of our message today is Fully Persuaded. Fully Persuaded. Romans 4, 21. Paul's writing here, and he says, And being fully persuaded that what God has promised, he is able to perform. Being fully persuaded that what God has promised, he is able to perform. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God that does not lie. Lord, that you're the only true and living God. And, Lord, you keep your word. You've never had to change it. You've never had to back up. You've never come to a place, God, where you could not do what you promised you would do. And so, Lord, today I'm asking, God, that your Holy Spirit might work in our lives so that we might find a place of being fully persuaded in all of the gospel, in all of your word, the value, Lord, of you in our lives and eternal life, God. Lord, that you might help us to move to a place of no compromise, no lukewarmness, but being fully persuaded, living our lives on that basis of your word, Father. We thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you, Lord, that you do do what you say you'll do, that you keep your word, God. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. There's a few books out there. Joshua Dow, wonderful Christian author and and he wrote a, a book called Believe. Believe. And in that, he explores the phenomena of the last 50 or 75 years in our culture to where people have gotten to a place where they're willing to believe things and not do those things. Where people are willing to believe that this is wrong and yet go ahead and, and, and do it anyway. And, uh, you know, we all deal with that a little bit. Um, I, I believe that I should exercise more, uh, but I don't do it a lot. I, I was going for walks there for a little while. I do have a membership at a gym, but my car is not nearly wore out. And uh, I do go swimming sometimes, but, but I believe that I ought to be in better shape, and I don't work real hard on it. So it's, it's a belief, but it's not something that I, I take to heart like I should probably. And, you know, there are things that we say, yeah, I know I shouldn't do that, but I do it anyway. And, you know, a hundred years ago, from what we can understand, people lived much closer to what they really, they believed it, they pretty well did. If they, if they believed the word of God was God's word, then, then they would live by that. If they believed that they ought to do certain things, then they went out and did it. But nowadays, there's a big disconnect. Psychologists are telling us and Christian authors are telling us that people are willing to believe things that they won't do, or they're willing to do things they don't believe. And, and I want to tell you, that's hurting us. That's hurting, and, and it filtrates the church, and it filtrates every part of our world. We're living in very uncertain days today, and I'm sure some of you uh, watch the prophecies and, and different people that are putting out words, and, and people ask me, well, what about these things? And I don't know for sure where we're at. I, I'd like to say, thus saith the Lord, and give you the details and things of, of where we are in these last days. But, but I think it's very reasonable to say we are living in the last days uh, since the Scripture records that Paul said we were in the last days. So we must be in the end of the last days. 
and, and there are trying things that are going on. I feel uh, in my lifetime, I'm 64 years old, these are the most uncertain times uh, for our nation. Amen. These are the most uncertain times uh, for us to look at the future from a from a uh, you know a physical point of view. Now Jesus makes it clear that we see all this kind of stuff come in the world. That as believers, if you're born again today, if your hope is steadfast and solid on Christ and His Word, then then we can look up and rejoice. We can. We know that somehow we get through this stuff to the other side, and we're going to win in the end of this thing. But I, I don't know about the roughness of the road between this point and that point. I don't know the duration or the time. And uh, so, so I can't make a lot of promises there. And so people say, well, what should we do? Well, what we should do, whatever we do, is get closer to God. Amen. Get closer to God. Get to know Him in a way you've never known Him before. Paul, and I was going to share this, but I won't read the scriptures. But in, in uh, Philippians, he talks about that I might know him. That I might know him. You know, there's a difference between serving God and knowing God. A whole lot of what we do is based upon, a whole lot of how we live our lives is what we do for God. And I'm not saying that's not important. But I will tell you, there is something far greater in the eyes of God than, than what I do for God. And it is that I know him intimately, close, that I live in fellowship with him, that, that he is the love of my life, that I care more about him than anything or anyone else, that, that he is the highest priority in my life, that what he says is something I want to do because I want to please him. I tell you, knowing him is of such great importance. In my lifetime, you know, education changed when I was a little boy. We prayed and read the Bible in school. We had a Christian flag and we had a, uh, a state flag. And we pledged allegiance. And I went to a public school in Louisville, Kentucky as a little boy. I remember uh, the day that President John F. Kennedy was uh, shot. We, we stopped school, came over the intercom. We didn't know yet that he had passed. And they ask us to pray for the President of the United States of America. And I tell you what, the world was a better place. The world was a better place when we watched Leave It to Beaver and Andy Williams and yeah. Dad, know, your father knows best, and uh, and uh, Kathy uh, was a Kathy Reed show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, God, we dare you, God. Yeah, you know the world was a better place. <laughs> When violence was somebody just falling over, you know. And when God, when God was uh, believed upon, even by those that didn't serve him, they respected God and his word to some degree. In a time when his name uh, and his commandments were posted in our schools and, and everywhere that you went, every event, God was honored with prayer. Every assembly started with prayer in school when I was a little boy. But I grew up in a time when Little by little, those things were taken away. And I have watched the erosion of America through its laws that are ungodly, through our rejecting of God, through taking him out of, you know, there are those that say the forefathers uh, didn't have, uh, you know, a confidence or a faith in God or didn't believe the Bible. But in our oldest buildings in America, what will you find carved in the stone of those buildings? You will find things about God. You, you will find inscriptions from the Word of God. You took you look at the quotes of early Americans, and they quoted the Bible often. He was quoted in the Capitol. He was quoted in the halls of Senate and Congress. He was quoted in political speeches in years gone by. God was important in America. Yeah. And now we're living in a time. 60, 75 years into this rejecting of God. And now we have riots in our streets all over the nation. We have law enforcement and authority that are unable to act to the defense of property. Now they're saving lives when they can, but, but we're, our, our hands are tied by some of, of a political force in 
our nation that wants to see us no longer be a democracy but become some other form of government. But I tell you what, our land needs to be a government under God. Amen. Under God. Amen. And we need God back. And guys, it's got to start in the lives of believers. I mean, we're comfortable in that we know Christ. We know the Lord. We're in church today. And in some of our states, our, our friend from Kim from California, you can't meet in your church legally. Is that right? In her church where she's at, they cannot have services. And, uh, you know, we're, we are seeing a eroding of our, our civil liberties, our, our rights as believers. But I want to tell you something. There is a right, uh, uh, there is something far greater even than that. And I'm not, certainly not supporting that. We're in church today. But I, we've got to get back to God in a very real and viable way so that we're relevant as Christians. We need to live according to the beliefs of God's word instead of following down the trail of our cultural denial of God. The way that we live needs to match the things that we say and hear on Sunday. You know, we need to live out these things out in the world. When other people are talking all the other stuff, I don't mean correcting them and telling them how wrong they are, but we need to be speaking the life of God's word, the love of Christ, the grace of God. And it's all right, my friends, to warn people that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine, that it matters how you live, that we all do give an account for our lives before God, that every life matters, every person Every single person is important to God. Amen. Amen. I'm blessed to know God. But I could have lived all these years without Christ. How tragic the last 46 years would have been. I'm the oldest living male in my biological family. Uh, uh, all the different stuff that my real family uh, did and the sins of our lives going back for generations and affected my life until I got born again. Oh, my goodness, it's caused our family to die young. But I'm 64 and healthy because of God in my life. I'm not in the addictions. I've been free all this. It's goodness of God. God is real. So our message today, being fully persuaded. We, we, we need to really let this soak into us, that, that everything that God said is important. All of his word matters. And so today as we look at that, um, we're going to ask three questions. And, uh, uh, you know, are you fully persuaded, first of all, that Christ alone is the only way to the Father? I have a friend, and I haven't seen him in a few years, but, but he pastored a church and a uh, different uh, organization, I guess. And, and uh, we were talking, and, and he's a very wonderful man. I've known him for many, many years. But we were talking one day, and I was shocked. When he told me that 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 Christ is, you know, Jesus, the God of the Bible, the Word of God, that that is the God and the religion uh, of Europeans and, and Americans, but but that the gods that other countries have, whether it be India or Bangladesh or or uh, you know whatever place in the world, whatever that that is their gods, and it's the same if they really believe that. And I, I couldn't believe that John believed that. I, I, I was shocked at that. He grew up in rural Bible Belt America. He went to church all his life, a very successful person. And yet, preaching the gospel in his church, that's what he preaches. I want to tell you, you know, do we really believe, are we fully persuaded that Christ is the only way? Yeah. We're going to answer that in a minute. I hope secondly, yeah. Are we fully persuaded that eternal salvation is the most important thing in this life? Amen. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful things. I have been blessed. God has fulfilled so many dreams in my life over the years. Things that I kind of liked, you know, and, and, and I kind of wanted, but I would not uh, invest my life or spend my money because I was busy with other things. And, just this last year, somebody gave me an expensive gift, and, and I appreciated that. And, and little did they know that that was something that uh, a good part of my life, I thought, boy, I would like to have one of those. But I never did go out and buy one. I, it just, you know, was something I, I, I was a little expensive that I didn't want to do. I'm not saying it would have been wrong. I'm just saying there are important things in this life, and the things of this life are not what's most important. It's our eternal life. 
and serving God. He blesses us and thank God for possessions and cars. And we live in a, a you know, we call this a resort area. And we get to go on the lake and, and we go out on boats and we get to fish and hunt and do things in this area. It's a wonderful place. But the things of this life, my friend, are not what's important. They're not what's really important. God and people is what matters. God and people is what's most important. And I tell you, that's the way God sees it, and it's important. And the third question that we're going to talk about uh, is that uh, the Bible, are you fully persuaded that the Bible is really God's word to and for us today? I'm so sad. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of the pastors of what we would call a mega church, another part of the country, uh, he began to write some blogs and put out some stuff. And one thing that I read of his was that it was time that we stopped believing in ancient letters and started just embracing people, no matter what their lifestyle was, no matter what they were into, uh, into the body of Christ. Now, I tell you what, we need to love everybody, regardless of their lifestyle. Everybody's welcome in this body of believers. They're welcome to come here. But my friend, the ancient letters that he was referring to was the New Testament, the Word of God, the Old Testament. He was referring to it was time we laid that aside. And, of course, over a period of a year or so, he ended up leaving his church in, in great chaos. And I'm not sure how that church is doing today. Departing from the Word of God is not the answer, my friend. This Word is still God's Word. I mean, when you read the Bible, that God so loved the world, it's as powerful. It may not be to us. It may not be to somebody listening. But it is as powerful to God as the day that He uttered it. Yeah. The day that He spoke it. It was as real to God that Jesus became the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, before we were ever created. On the day that Christ was crucified, it was equally as well as, as relevant and real and powerful. But I tell you what, the gospel's got to be believed. You've got to believe this book in order for it to change your life. And that's why we have in America today and around the world highly educated theologians, people that speak multiple languages, understand Greek and Hebrew, and yet do not even believe in the virgin birth. And they're the ones that are turning out the ministers in our generation today. God forgive us. God help us. God deliver us from our stupidity. This, this book... You know, I, I've got it electronically, 42 versions there. I've got it in my phone. I've got a pocket one from the Gideons. I've got this one. I understand it's not original language, but it is God-breathed yeah. so that we can have it today. And it is inspired by God as people were moved by the Holy Spirit and penned these eternal words and they're relevant today. So those three things we're going to talk about today. Uh, a little side trail because I just can't preach without them. Truth really matters. And in our world today, we've been taught situational ethics. We've been taught that uh, absolutes don't exist. And I, I like what Robbie Zacharias said to somebody on a college campus. Professor stood up and, and he talked about that there were no absolutes. And he talked about all kinds of stuff. And when he got done, Robbie Zacharias said to him, Are is that absolutely true? <laughs> the man stood there a minute because he was saying it's absolutely true that there are no absolutes. <laughs> Can you understand that man's wisdom is foolish before God? We think we're smart. We have many philosophies and ideals. I'm not opposed to education. Thank God somebody made a car. I wouldn't want to be walking. I'm glad for the tennis shoes I got on. I don't know how they made them, but they did. I'm grateful for the iPad and iPhone and, and uh, whatever, you know, the stuff we got. I'm not opposed to science. In fact, true science is constantly just uncovering much of what the Bible already teaches us. But truth has become non-relevant today to many people. It's taught that on the college campus. There aren't any absolutes, but I promise you that God is absolute. His word is absolutely true. Christ still stands, the only hope that we have. And the word of God will be relevant a million years from now. It will still work. People will look back and they'll say, oh my goodness, I had that in my hand and didn't value it. 
I had it on my shelf to let it gather dust. I had it in my phone and occasionally listened to it. Instead of giving it the rightful place in our life that it should be. Well, Jesus was on trial before Pilate. And Pilate asked the question of Jesus. He said to Jesus, what is true? And then the astounding thing is, it appears that as soon as they asked Christ, he turned away from truth and he began talking to the Jews who ended, uh, ultimately, that conversation ended with Christ being crucified. He stood before the truth giver, the one who is truth, and he asked what is truth and he did not wait for an answer. I tell you today that there are many today that will look at the word of God and they'll browse its pages a little bit and they'll go online and find out what some critic has said and they'll decide that this book isn't worth the trouble. They'll hold the truth of the ages in their hands. They'll hold the precious word of God and they'll decide it's too big, it's too long. They may look and say, I've got friends that go to church and say they believe the Bible and don't live any different than me. And I'm sorry that's true quite often, but God wants us to be a generation of people starting today that begin to live what we say and get out and live our lives boldly for Christ, loving people, helping people, sacrificing our life for the cause of Christ. Whether it's here or in a jungle somewhere or an island somewhere or a hostile country somewhere. My goodness, Pilate asked the greatest question to the greatest Truth, and he didn't stick around for an answer. John 1, verse 14 says, The Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me just say that we can't just take the grace of God without the truth of God and have a relationship with God that's going to work real well. Does that understand? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? There are those who want to just talk about the grace of God but ignore all of the Word of God. We need both. <laughs> Jesus was manifest in the Word of God, manifest in the flesh through the life of Jesus, and He was full of grace and truth. Truth. Yeah. Truth matters. And this book is true. John 17, 17, uh, Jesus said to the Father in his prayer, the long prayer that he prayed. It's an amazingly long prayer. Maybe the long, I believe it's the longest prayer in the Bible. But part of it said, sanctify or purify them through thy truth. And then Jesus said, your word, Father, is truth. It's the word of God. And in 1 Peter 1, 22, Peter said, seeing you purify your souls in obeying the truth. We need to obey the truth of God's word. In obeying the truth through the spirit, we need God's spirit dwelling in us. We've got to be born again, or I understand this word is very hard to understand. But with the spirit of God indwelling us with a humble heart and a prayerful attitude towards God and reverence towards his word, he will teach us and we will grow and we will become more and more and more like Jesus. In obeying the truth through the Spirit and love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart. So, I wonder today, are you fully persuaded of those three truths? That Christ alone is the only way to the Father, that eternal salvation is the most important thing in your life, and that the Bible is really God's Word and relevant for us today. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. So I want to answer that first question. You might want to turn to Philippians, the second chapter. In fact, I will answer these questions from there. Philippians, the second chapter. Are you fully persuaded that Christ alone is the only way to the Father? Is he the only way to eternal life? Philippians 2, talking about Christ here. And being found in fashion as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly excited, exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, when you read that verse, it appears to me that Jesus is the very center of this whole thing. That he, God's Son, Emmanuel, with us, God with us, coming and dwelling here. You know the story of Christ. I'm not going to go through all that today.
today. But he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He died for our sins. There was no other substitute. All the Old Testament sacrifices, the lamb, the scapegoat lamb, and the lamb sacrifice, and the blood sprinkled on the altar, all of those things were pointing towards the, the lamb of God slain for the foundation of the world. Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And it's going to be in eternity before heaven, before the earth, and everything under the earth. Through every part of the universe, there is coming a day when Christ, the exalted Son of God, given a name above every name, where every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and confess that he is Jesus, Lord, and Master. He's the only way. It's through Christ alone. I, I, I've talked to people of many other persuasions and many other beliefs, and, and it breaks my heart. The Bible and God's Word, the, the life, the things that we have, the information that we have in our book is not like other books. This book stands alone. It has prophecies and things that have already happened that you can go back and study. Archaeology proves it. Yeah. This Word is true, and Christ is the only way for me. He's the only way for anybody. Acts uh, four ten says, and, 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 and uh, you know they're, they're preaching there, and this is where the miracle took place of the crippled man when Peter and John went to the temple. You probably remember that story. It begins, I believe, in chapter three of Acts, but uh, chapter four, Peter says, "Be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him does this man stand here." For you whole. This is the stone which was set aside by you builders, which has become the head cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I think that's pretty clear. There are many other verses. And somebody said, yes, but that's just what the Bible says. I understand that. But he was raised from the dead, seen of over 500 witnesses, many of them still alive in Paul's day. He said, you can go ask them if you want to. Many of them still alive. The, the story of Jesus wasn't made up decades later. The story of Jesus real time starting 2,000 years ago. And those who saw him and confessed him as Lord went to their graves confessing that he is the Son of God. And he is raised from the dead. People say you can't prove the tomb is empty. They couldn't find a body. That's enough evidence. Wrong one of the body. The Sanhedrin one of the body. They wanted proof. And they could not find him because he wasn't there anymore. He's alive. But he was seen over 500 people. And they gave their lives. You don't give your lives for lies if you know their eyes. And these people said we were eyewitnesses of these things. We beheld him. We knew him. So that first question in my mind is settled. I don't think there's any other way. Neither is there salvation in any other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. Secondly, this morning, that eternal salvation is the most important thing in life. Are you fully persuaded that your eternal salvation is the most important thing in life? You know, over the years, witnessing, sharing the gospel, Many times going into a hospital where someone is at moments from death's door and pleading with them to receive Christ and some who did receive Christ and some who did not receive Christ. I remember one man in particular and he was a successful man. I'd known him many years and I went to the hospital to, to, to try to persuade him Christ. I went three times. He was in a hospital about 40 miles from where I lived and I drove over there three different occasions and the first time, uh, part of the family wanted me to leave. They, they didn't want me there. And so I did I did give to that eventually and go on. Uh, you know, that's hard when a man's dying and he doesn't know Christ. And then I went back and shared with him a couple of times. And finally, he told me, that, and we talked. And, and, and uh, let me remind you, he was a church goer, but he didn't know Christ. I mean, you know, going to church won't get you to heaven. Being in this building will not get you to heaven. Standing in a pulpit will not get you to heaven. You must know Christ yourself. You must have an up-to-date personal experience with Jesus Christ. 
Paul, after all the years, after all he went through, after the shipwrecks, the beatings, the persecution, the tortures, he said, oh, but I tell you, I count all of that as nothing. He said that I might gain Christ, that I might know him. Paul said, I don't want to know more about him. I, I, I don't want to just do more for him. He said that I might know him, even to the point that I might be partaker in his suffering and partaker in his resurrection. You see, Paul just wanted to know Jesus better after years of serving him through hardship and struggle. He wasn't uh, like today's people. He wasn't taking it for granted. He was on fire and bold for God to his dying days. He said, I want to know him better. Is that the cry of your heart today, believer? Is that the cry of your heart today on, on Facebook or YouTube? Do you want to know God better? It doesn't matter where we're at. There is more of him to know. There is more you can know him better. And you won't satisfy that with good works. That won't do it. You might be content in the flesh, but not in your soul. We've got to really know him. He's got to be in the innermost being of our lives. It's so important. It's so important. Salvation. Are you fully persuaded? It's the most important thing. Beginning there again at verse 12 in Philippians, the second chapter. Wherefore, my beloved brother, as you always obey. You know, the gospel is something that needs to be obeyed. It's not just believed. It's an action thing, too. Paul said, you always obey. Not only when I was with you, but even much more since I've been gone. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can you see uh, the cry of his heart? Don't take this for granted. You've obeyed. You've done the right things. But work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul said this is the most important thing. Work it out. Serve the Lord. Dig in. Ask God to search your heart and dig it out one piece at a time if necessary. Any wicked way within us. Cleanse us. Wash us. Purge us. Oh, Lord, don't let us stay like we are. Don't let us stay like we are. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Salvation is a ticket that I got set a long time ago. It's not a card that was punched. It is a beginning of a life that we live for Christ. I got born again in 1974. And I, I was saved if I died the next day. Still with, with the drugs that would have been in my system. With the life and the foulness of my life. If I would not have woken up the next morning. I believe I would have went to be with Jesus. Because I had found him the night before. He came into my life. He had changed me. Not in the way that I felt different, but I just was. I was free. I didn't have to use or drink or smoke or do those things. That night, my life was changed dramatically. And I couldn't sleep that night. So I went to God and said, God, if you'll help me, I'll live for you all my life. Lord, if you'll help me, I'll break every relationship. I'll burn every bridge and I'll live for you the rest of my life. And God showed up in my life and kept me all these years. But I was saved then. And I've been being saved over the years through the transformation, working power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I am a new creature in Christ, but He's not done working on me yet. And someday I will be saved. I will receive the end of my salvation. Someday I will be at that place where I am no longer here, but I am there. Maybe in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, maybe the day Christ will rise first and maybe it will be me. Maybe I will be dead in Christ. Or maybe we which are alive and remain will be caught up to be with the Lord there. Maybe I'll be among that group of believers. Maybe Christ returns today. Or maybe today something else happens in my life and Christ hasn't come. But I go be with him because, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. To be absent from this body is to be present with our Lord. So we're looking forward to that. Salvation matters. It's important. It ought to be not that you run around terrified you're unsaved because you've done something wrong. But when you do something wrong, go to God and ask Him to forgive you just like you would somebody on this earth. Just like you would some Father, I blew it, God. I ask you to help me and forgive me. And Lord, work in my life. Give me victory over this area of my life where I'm struggling. 
salvation? Are you fully convinced that it is your eternal salvation is the most important thing in this life? Or are there other things that are more important? Are there the cares of this life, the pleasures of this life, the, the things that glitter, and the things that attract us, the things that we're drawn to? Are those more important in your life? I can't answer that question for you, and I, I can't judge that in your life. You have to do that. But what is most important in your life? Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. In Matthew 16, 24, and these are the words of Christ. I, I like what he had to say, don't you? Jesus said unto his disciples, now I don't think that's limited to the twelve, because there are many groups that are called disciples in the Gospels. But it was certainly them as well, and everybody else that heard. He said unto his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what, is it a pro what, what does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And those are the words of red. If you have that kind of red letter edition Bible, those are the words of Christ. What advantage is it if we gain everything the world has to offer? If we have the highest of prestige and power, if we enjoy the greatest of foods and luxury and possession, and those things are not wrong in themselves. Jesus had many wealthy followers, but he had a few people. One man in particular, a rich run, young ruler, who said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was saying, how big a check? And Jesus I talked to him about the commandments, the boy had done well. And he said, here's something you need to do, sir. You go sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He made the worst business deal of a lifetime for a wealthy investor. He chose, went away sad, but he wasn't willing to follow Christ and Christ alone. He wasn't willing to lay down what he valued more than anything else in his life, his stuff, in exchange for his soul. I tell you, it's one thing to have stuff, but it's really tragic for stuff to have you. When you've got to have when you can't live without, when you must, 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 you're addicted to the pleasures and things in this life. And according to the Word of God, it appears it will cost you your soul. Yeah. It's a terrifying thing. To stand before God, especially to have heard the truth, to have known the truth, and made a choice like that man did. Some people start on the journey with Christ, but eventually decide it costs too much, and they go back. Go back to another way. Is your salvation the most important possession that you have in this life? Do you value that more than anything else? Third, we want to talk about, are you fully persuaded that the Bible is really God's Word? Do you really believe that? Is that, or do we find ourselves in like Joshua Dow's book and others, I believe this, but not enough to live this. I, I know what he says, but this is what I want. And I struggle with that in my life sometimes. Oh my goodness, it tears our hearts apart. We have to make a choice sometimes. Moses grew up in the palace of Egypt. Now he was a Jewish boy. He was uh, saved by God in that little ark that floated across the river to the to the Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, and she raised him, and, and his sister ran over and said, Princess, I know I can get a Hebrew lady that'll come nurse and raise that little boy. And of course, Princess just wanted a boy to play with. She wanted a, a son to play with. She didn't want to do all that. So she said, Well, go get me one. And so uh, his sister went and got who? Went and got his mom. And so Moses not only was saved through, through the parents uh, not willing to crucify or kill him like they were doing to little boys, but uh, he made a way for mom. And so she grew up in the palace too, taking care of her own son and telling him the stories of God. It didn't have it written down, but she told him stories as the tradition was from her mouth about the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and earth. 
And he grew up educating all the things of Egypt and wealthy with gold chariots and horses, whatever you can imagine. But he stirred within him about God and the God of heaven. And one day he decided, I'm going to help set God's people free. He felt a call and tug in his life. I don't know that he went about it the right way, but he got involved in a conflict between an Egyptian and a slave. And he ended up, before it was over, with killing that Egyptian. And then he has to flee. And he lives 40 years in the wilderness, taking from his father all sheep because he never was able to obtain his own herd, I suppose. And then a bush experience. He goes back to set God's people free and know the story. It says in Hebrews that he denounced the pleasures and the wealth of Pharaoh's palace, choosing rather to suffer the reproaches of Christ. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to serve Christ even if it costs us something or even if it costs everything? We live in a time and I hope this doesn't happen. But wonder if things would go further and further. Wonder if it comes to a place where we can't talk about Jesus. Where we're not allowed in public to speak the name of Christ. Are you willing to stand up? Wonder if it's like my friends in Bangladesh that have had their families tor tortured or even lost their lives because they shared the gospel. Wonder if that would come to America. Oh, Pastor, that'll never happen here. I hope it never happens here. But the day to get close to God, today that to come to a place where Christ and Christ alone means more than life itself, is now not then. Not when your family is being mistreated. Not when you're being rejected. Not when you can't work anymore because you name the name of Christ. We cannot compromise. We must be willing to stand bold and stand strong. But I want to tell you something today. If you do not truly believe what the Word of God says, you'll have nowhere to get strength from. You understand? We can read the promises. We can go to His Word. We can see things that are coming into this world. And we can say, God knew this and His grace is going to be sufficient. People before us endured such hardship, and yet they served Christ to the end. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, that hallmark of chapter of faith and the consequence of Christ that people paid. Are we willing to fully believe that part of the Word of God? Are we willing to believe that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution? How many of you know I didn't add that? It's in there. How many of you know that Jesus said in the Beatitudes, we like the first part, but then he said, some of you are going to be persecuted, some of you are going to be killed, but blessed are you when you find yourself in that situation. You can't get there with a self-help book. You can't get there with a YouTube video. You understand what I'm saying? You're only going to get there by immersing yourself in his spirit and in his word and living close to the throne of God to where he grows so big within you that everything else loses its glitz and glamour. Everything else becomes less important and you find yourself loving God and loving one another above everything else in life. You know, there's a place in him where when everything's gone, some people wouldn't notice because they weren't holding on to those things. Dear Corey Ted Boone, in the latter years of her life, and I'm sure many of you know Corey Ted Boone's story, the concentration camp and all that she went through in World War II. She said she had learned, I saw her saying this in a movie in a rocking chair, and she was rocking, an elderly woman. She said, I've learned to not hold anything in this life very tightly, lest the Lord would have to come and pull it from my hands. Yeah. You see, if you're holding on to things, you won't be able to hold on to Jesus too much. I have enjoyed wonderful pleasures and wonderful gifts. And God meets my needs and I'm well taken care of. But those things are not what's most important. And I must have his word that strength to endure. I must have those stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I must have confidence that God is going to show up. I must know that when I am weak, he is strong. I must know that I can depend upon God to never leave me or forsake me, no matter what happens in my life or no matter what happens to my family. Of course, our visitors don't know, but I have a daughter that goes in places to share where it's not okay. Not okay. Recently flew out of the country. It was a much better place this week. I slept better. But God is good. God is good. Amen. God is good. Christ alone is my only hope. 
He's my only hope. And I want to tell you, it's a wonderful hope because the day will come when all this stuff will fall. Jesus said about his word, he said that uh, heaven and earth, in fact, Matthew 24, 35, and also in Mark and Luke, and then John doesn't use the same statement, but he alludes to it. Jesus says this, heaven and earth will pass away. Everything in and everything we hold dear, every possession, every honor, every power and prestige, all of that stuff is going to pass away. Paul, while he was yet living, said he considered all of that as animal waste. That's what he says in, in Philippians, a little farther now. He said, heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus said, my words will not. Well, I'm gone a little long, forgive me. Some would say I'm not sincere in repentance because I do it often. But in Luke's gospel, I won't read the whole chapter. But it is the story, uh, beginning at verse 19, of a rich man and a poor man. And by the way, this is not a parable. So many people think uh, and it's a parable. It's not a parable. This, he said it's a certain beggar. Or a beggar gave a name Lazarus and a certain rich man. Not a parable. Here's the true story. And, and, and their lives were much different. The beggar carried outside the gate of the rich man's house. And, and he, was, he was crippled. So, so the dogs licked his wounds. And sometimes the servants would bring out some food apparently. And throw out the gate for that beggar so he would have something to eat. And that was his lot in life. It was not a good lot. It was not a good circumstance. But apparently this beggar was not a bitter man. He was a beggar, but he must have been a believer. He was a righteous person because when he died, angels came and carried him into Abraham's bosom. And there's a whole message there about paradise, and that's what the thief said on the cross. Remember me in paradise? She said yes, and they went into the heart of the earth. But anyway, that's another message. And in that place, he was comforted. And in that place, apparently, he could walk. In that place, he had drink and food and everything was good. Or waiting for the Messiah who was going to come and redeem them and take them into heaven someday. The first resurrection. Many of the Old Testament saints, Matthew 27 says, after the resurrection of Christ, raised up from the graves around Jerusalem, were seen of many in the streets of Jerusalem. That was a resurrection after Christ of these Old Testament believers. And apparently, Lazarus, the baby, would have been one of them. And, and then there was this rich man who died and lifted up his eyes in hell being tormented. Hell is a real place. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. It's really important. It's a big deal. And, and so, so he began to see what was going on, and he could apparently talk to Father Abraham. And he cried out, and he said, Oh, let Lazarus bring me a drip of water on my tongue. I'm thirsty in this place. I'm tormented in flames. And Abraham said, No. No, he can't. There's a thick gulf. It's too late now. That time has passed. You've made a choice. It's irreversible. I tell you, in America, we don't like that. We want to be the exception to the rule. We want to get there late and get the same benefit that we got there on time. We want the extension of the day. We want to be able to do it wrong and it work out right. How many of you know that that's America? Now, let me say this. I love America. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But we're spoiled brass. Is that okay? We're a small. I mean, if they don't get my coffee right. I mean, don't you see that in stores or in places? Food? Oh my goodness, I can't eat that. It's got sesame seeds on it. My goodness, God help us. God help us. He, he said, you've made your choice. It's too late. And last is company and you're tormented. He said there's a gold fix. And then this man who never cared about anybody else apparently lived sumptuously wealthy and everything met, catered to in every way. He began to think about his family, his father's house, his five brothers that did not know the Lord. And he said, I don't want them to come here. This man in hell cared more about all souls than believers do sometimes. We, we're up here. We're walking on this side of the grave. We can tell people. We can send the gospel. We can write checks. We can sacrifice a possession to help speed the gospel somewhere. And yet sometimes we're bored with too many of those kind of sermons and too much missionary talk or whatever. I'm sure it's not the people hearing me today, but if those other people were there, they would be shaking their heads, I'm sure. And he said, I, I care. I don't want them to end up here. And then Abraham said the most amazing thing to him. He said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them hear them. What was Moses and the prophets? Moses and the prophets was the word of God that they had. Moses was long since gone. The prophets had long since passed away. But the Old Testament word of God that this man probably was aware of, that they were teaching and preaching in Jesus' day, right up to the time of uh, John, the scripture says, he said, they've got the prophets. They've got the Bible. That's what he's saying. Do you, are you fully convinced that the Bible is the word of God? This man in hell was getting a lesson on the Bible, on the word of God. And then Abraham said something that's profound. He said, even if one, even if Lazarus rose from the dead, went back, went into the homes of your brothers, went into their bedrooms and woke them up, and said to them that he you know, told them the story of the gospel. He said if they won't hear the words of the prophets and Moses, they would not believe and repent if one went back from the dead. You see, Peter tells us a more sure word, more than a vision, more than a dream, more than what somebody said. He said it is the written word of God. The word of God is powerful, sharp, and it is the edge sword. It can cut between the spirit and the soul. Man, it can go deep and do surgery within us to bring us to a place of humility and repentance, crying out to God. We need the God's word in the world today is neglected and stop believe it's considered archaic, old-fashioned, and irrelevant. But you and I, we should above all people be fully convinced. And indeed, indeed what Jesus was telling us there is if they won't hear God's word, they won't believe if somebody comes back from the dead. And how many of you know he came back from the dead? And most did not believe. He was prophesying his own return. His death, burial, and resurrection. Well, I ask today, in closing, finally, somebody said. Paul, in one of his letters, says, finally, it goes for two more chapters. I want to be like Paul when I grow up. Are you fully persuaded? Maybe you're listening on Facebook, or you're going to see this uh, recap on uh, YouTube. Are you fully persuaded that Christ alone is the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven? Are you fully persuaded that eternal life is the most important thing in this life? And it is. It's here that decision is made, not later when you find out from that story. And thirdly, are you fully persuaded that the Bible is really God's word to us, for us today? Those three questions are among many in the Bible. But boy, those are important. So important. As a believer, I realize I need to up my persuasion things of God. I, I, I need to get a little closer with what I say I believe and the way that I live. I do want to say it's not just doing it for God. It is being in Christ. It is Christ being in me. It is that I might know Him in every way, in every dimension. Intimacy with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is so critical. And we live in the world and I do not know when people ask me what it's going to look like 12 months from now. We may see this as a bad dream that we had, or we may still be struggling with the aftermath of, of sickness, of loss of lives, of political unrest, of rioting in our streets, violence, of shortages in grocery stores. I don't know. Pastor, I don't like it. I like it better when you talk about all the goodness and blessing of God. I promise you, this is the goodness and blessing of God, that we can endure these things with Him. He's going to help His children. He's going to get us through these things. But is it always going to be easy? Not always, guys. How many of you have had some hard times in your life when you were serving God? I remember seven years ago when my wife and I in my arms. I was living for Jesus. I was pastoring this church. I was working hard. And I still hurt. I still suffer. You understand? It wasn't God doing anything against me. It's this life we live in is a mess. The most important thing has got to be that relationship with God. Yeah. So today, uh, folks on YouTube and Facebook, I, I just I plead with you today, get your house in order. Get your life right with God. Cry out to God. He'll forgive you and come in your heart and be Lord of your life. If you're a backslider today, I encourage you. Cry out to God. Come back. Run to the altar again. And if you're a believer, be a believer. 
Believe in such a way that there's no doubt of what's going on in your life. Need help with that? Contact me through comments, or message, and I'd be glad to send you some resources. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. If we could, we'll dim the lights.